that one went. I mean, we came around. We started pounding the wood line with the Mark 19. They had a they had a PCAM, you know, that was their support by fire out there. We started hitting that wood line. The uh, rest of the guys dismounted from the vehicles, and we used the vehicles as our support by fire in an L-shaped type ambush. They came around and swept through the field and cleared everybody that was left. Um, I think it was a it was a 14 14 man element that I was against. We had we had a few bodies, you know. I mean, we we threw three in the back. There was a few other pieces around and whatnot afterwards, but you know, to get to the end of that. And you hear, all right, like everything quiets down afterwards. And maybe, maybe that's like a 10 minute, 10 minute firefight. I mean, we just swept right through. It was pretty much picture perfect. And afterwards though, I'm like, I'm waiting. All right. Who's hit? Who's been hit? Cause that's normally what's going to happen. Who do we got to get out of here or medevac? None of our guys, nobody. It was just, it went picture perfect right through, um, battle drill one, you know, your bread and butter. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Change Agents, an ironclad original proudly presented by Montana Knife Company. Today's episode is with Will Yeski, and it centers around his book, Damn the Valley, which is about his Afghanistan deployment in late 2009 and 2010, in which members of 2nd Battalion, 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment experienced a 52% casualty rate. Specifically, the episode is why these kind of stories need to be told why they need to be told now, why they need to be told in the future, and why they never need to be forgotten. I am not the person who came up with the phrase, if you do not study your history, you are doomed to repeat it. But I think it's very true. And if we don't talk about these stories, and we don't talk about these experiences, it is my worry and my concern that when we get to decision points in the future, the human capital toll is forgotten. And it somehow becomes easier to make decisions that launches the United States and those that wear its uniform in service of their nation in directions that can lead to stories and situations that the book Damn the Valley is about. A little bit about Will before we get into the episode. He served for more than 10 years in the United States Army. And as he explains in the book, Three members of his company were killed in action. Half of the company had uh, Purple Hearts awarded to them, and more than a dozen suffered life-changing injuries. There was even a point where the entire prosthetic ward at Walter Reed was full of the men who patrolled the area, specifically the Argandab River Valley, which we'll get into in the episode. These stories are hard to hear, and they're hard to look at, and that's exactly why we should. With that, let's get into today's episode with Will Yeski. So September 2009, you arrive in Afghanistan. You're with the 82nd Airborne. We'll just describe uh, the three-week course at Fort Benning as something that could be compressed into about 12 hours, so we can skip over that. It's learning how to fall from a high object onto the ground in a parachute that is not slowing you down nearly enough to prevent injury often. Um, talk to me about how that was when you first arrived there with the 82nd Airborne. Well, so... Coming over to the 82nd, we were being removed out of the special forces course. So you're going from, you know, that end of things into, I guess that end, of, you were still treated as, you know, the new guy and everything. But when you went over to the 82nd, it became very apparently different. You know, a lot of it was micromanaged to the point of you had a little bit more leeway over there. Uh, but you're over in conventional army and it just completely, Hey, here's a, here's an EFAS or a, or a PFC. 
you know, brand new guy has no idea what to do falling into the rank of, you know, a few thousand. So I understand the necessity to do that, but man, like I knew right from the get go, I was told, Hey, don't, don't show up for in processing until midday because you're going to be in there until, you know, at least until five. And we were in there come to find out it was like the day of one of their um, military balls for the previous deployment. They had just come back not too, not too long prior. And we showed up on a day that we, we didn't show up until our company to sign in. They didn't have anybody bring us over there until like, it was about nine o'clock at night. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Well, first sergeant's got to see you before you come in. That's just the, the tradition, <laughs> you know? And it was like uh, indoctrination into the airborne cult there, I guess that was, um, you know, just understanding that, Hey, this, this is how they do it over here. This is that dress, right? Dress type thing. And yet, you are um, that square peg that they're trying to put in that round hole, man. So, like, figure out how to adapt quickly or you're going to be that odd one out that gets that attention all the time. Yeah, You don't want that type of attention. <laughs> so, obviously, you get integrated there. You guys get your deployment orders. You land in Afghanistan. What was your mission? What were you guys assigned to be doing? And how long were you scheduled to be there? That's the whole thing about that particular one. We were originally slated for Iraq. And we ended up coming down on, uh, you know, they had a, a, the Kandahar surge pushed into Afghanistan and we were really the next unit that was up to deploy. So we were diverted using uh, President Obama signed executive orders that sent us to Afghanistan. And it was supposed to be an advise and assist mission, uh, which we ended up doing some of um, uh, in Helmand province. That was kind of our first first portion we showed up in country they didn't really know where to put us so originally we were trying to get into the battle of marja with the british and the marines that were out there and they they didn't want anything to do with it you know they were just like hey bunch of bunch of paratroopers bunch of cowboys jumping out here and um they didn't want us in in their battle space so we ended up doing this mission to where it was just up and down the highway and, you know, we did end up getting into a, our first firefight out there, but it wasn't anything, you know, out there was a lot of that conventional type of deployment, hurry up and wait. You know, they, they didn't want anything to do with it. And it wasn't until later on to where our battalion commander, um, Lieutenant Colonel Genio, went to uh, the ISAF commander at the time was Stanley McChrystal. And General McChrystal, he had been an aide at one point. General McChrystal kind of was like, oh, I have a slice of something for you. You know, you guys want some, you have some hungry paratroopers. I got a spot for you. And we replaced um, 117 Strikers in the Argonaut River Valley. You can look up the previous stuff with uh, Colonel Harry Tunnell to where, I mean, he was going at it as a uh, counter guerrilla operation. And I mean, they were rolling through there was strikers with search and destroy on the side and it was just this mentality of kill them all and it wasn't it didn't align with the coin fight it didn't align with anything and what they should be doing i mean i'm sure you've seen it to where when you do something like that in a country like afghanistan you know it doesn't matter who they are all those ties go to the side and they're like all right well that's our common enemy all right fine and they all they put their differences aside and that's the objective yeah, I have seen that firsthand, and I've also seen firsthand when elements come through. You were talking about the COIN strategy, and for people listening not aware, that stands for counterinsurgency, which was heavily uh, shifting to the forefront, I'd say, around the 2008. My last deployment there was 2010, and it was it was all by, with, and through. They wanted an Afghan face on the Afghan fight, and I totally understand that because if you're going to leave at some point, you need to be able to hopefully turn over the fighting, um, you know how that worked out 10 years, a little bit down the road is a podcast for a different day, but the local population has the ability to absolutely save lives, whether it's just saying, Hey, don't go down this road, you know, or just waving you off. Or like you said, the seek and destroy on the side of the tank and not really giving two shits about civilian casualties, killing somebody who's innocent. And the next thing you know, not only are they not telling you not to go down that road, they're telling people who want to kill you where they likely should emplace IEDs. So it's, you know, it's absolutely critical. Um, you mentioned briefly the first fi- uh, first firefight you guys got into. I mean, it happened on Halloween Day, so we're not going to skip over this. 
you got to at least give me the wave tops because I'm assuming it was your first exposure to combat. And I'm curious how it felt for you. I was. Um, and that's actually the whole reason what tied into the book release date, which was kind of cool. Halloween fell on a Tuesday in 2023. And that's um, what I was able to snag from the publisher. But uh, were you wearing yeah, a costume? Was, uh, what's that? Were you wearing a costume? <laughs> Absolutely not. However, <laughs> however, down the road, the after party that happened uh, at the British compound in Helmand, some of the guys did have fashioned out pirate costumes from like mops. They had beards going on from mops and broom handles and all sorts of. <laughs> of course they did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're going down the highway and there was a group of Afghan police that was with us. And they, they decided to dip out early. You know, they were like, hey, we're a mile away. And they got a little complacent, you know, and they just decided to go ahead of us. And we're like, all right, no problem. You know, we're going to keep clearing culverts just because we don't want to get blown up. I've seen it happen down this highway multiple times. And they're like, ah, oh, we'll take our chances. See you later. And uh, well, we'll wave on the way by. And as we come up to this small village, there's their truck isn't smashed in the side of a uh, one of the houses over there. I'm like, what the heck? And you come up and we're, I'm in truck number two and I'm driving it. And all of a sudden you start hearing the, the dings and the pops and the whizzes going by. And you're like, Oh, well, shoot. Gunner up top. Oh shit. We're, we're under fire. And it was instantly going into, all right, what's going on around me. And I, I knew better, you know, we're in an up armored Humvee. You know, so really the the one thing I'm looking for is either smoke trails or where where should I be looking for if somebody pops out with an RPG? And ultimately it was the fact that we had a Mark 19, which uh is you know your mounted grenade launcher, dual uh combined dual with a with a M240 machine gun. I'm like, we need to get this thing in the fight because the one in front of us only had a 50 cal. And if we're we're dealing with trying to smash these guys let's get the bigger gun into the fight so as this is going down i roll around you know ask permission and i come around to the front of the other truck and as i'm doing so uh that number one truck up in front the gunner couldn't traverse the weapon systems down we were that close so we have a squad size element bounding up uh doing the same tactics that we taught them bounding up on on our position and as i'm passing by that's right when they did they had no idea we were there yet and that was apparent because as soon as that guy rounds that corner and he looks up and he sees you know this u.s military truck sitting on the highway right in front of him his eyes got as big as saucers you're you talking know, about an enemy he, fighter that was that close it was that that close yeah it, i mean literally maybe maybe 50 feet and and I want to explain to people what you mean, too, when it comes to traversing a weapon. Um, let's just say for safety of occupants in the vehicle, we don't let the weapon point all the way straight down. You know, 40 millimeter has a uh, piezo, piezoelectric um, firing mechanism that has to spin. So those might bounce off the uh, armored Humvee uh, <laughs> roof, but a 50 cal or the 249 is not going to. So there's hard stop. So what you're describing is an enemy that is in a proximity to you that because of that hard stop for the safety of the people in the vehicle, he can't actually orient his weapon towards that fighter and shoot. Yeah. And that had to do with because we were on a raised road already and you're looking at this weapon system is 14 you know, yeah. 10 to 14 feet up because it's uh, mounted on top of a um, MRAP. So he ended up getting tossed a uh, M249 machine gun from underneath, which is a squad automatic weapon. And he jumps up into the turret and smokes two guys right there. You know, I mean, it was just, it was one of the wildest things to see. And when you hear in training or you hear, you know, we had heard some of the drill sergeants and stuff talk about, your adrenaline starts pushing in a firefight like that. And you see things that will happen. They're going to seem superhuman. And that's exactly what that type of situation was. I mean, you have somebody jumping up into a turret and just brah, just like that. I mean, it was nuts. I haven't really ever seen anything like that since. Yeah. Fair. Uh, so how'd the rest of the ambush play itself out? 
that one went, I mean, we came around, we started pounding the wood line with the Mark 19. They had a, they had a PCAM, you know, that was their support by fire out there. We started hitting that wood line. The uh, rest of the guys dismounted from the vehicles and we used the vehicles as our support by fire in an L-shaped type ambush. They came around and swept through the field and cleared everybody that was left. Um, I think it was a, it was a 14, 14 man element that I was against. We had, we had a few bodies, you know, I mean, we, we threw three in the back. There was a few other pieces around and whatnot afterwards, but you know, to get to the end of that and to hear, all right, like, everything quiets down afterwards. And maybe, maybe that's like a 10 minute, 10 minute firefight. I mean, we just swept right through. It was pretty much picture perfect. And afterwards though, I'm like, I'm waiting. All right. Who's hit, who's been hit. Cause that's normally what's going to happen. Who do we got to get out of here or medevac? None of our guys, nobody. It was just, it went picture perfect right through, um, battle drill one, you know, your bread and butter. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more fired up to introduce the presenting sponsor for season two of change agents, Montana knife company founded by somebody that I feel very fortunate to call a personal friend, Master Bladesmith, Josh Smith. Not only a Master Bladesmith, but the youngest Master Bladesmith and one of the most experienced in the world. Montana Knife Company blades are some of the finest that I've ever been able to get my hands on. They are the sharpest knife out of the box and they're some of the easiest to resharpen when you dull the blade. I take them everywhere that I go. I have them in every vehicle that I own and every backpack that I ever take into the backcountry. Specifically, my favorite blade of theirs is the Speedgo. It's lightweight, but so incredibly capable. I never leave home without it. If you're familiar with Montana Knife Company, you know it is often very difficult to get one of their blades because they sell out within minutes of being released. What you should be able to find in stock are the Blackfoot 2.0, Speedgo, or a Stonewall Skinner. And if you use the code CHANGEAGENTS10, that's going to net you 10% off of your first order. Again, my personal favorite blade is the Speedgo. If they have them in stock right now, don't mess around. Put it in your cart and complete the checkout. Montana Knife Company, they build working knives for working people. And like I said at the beginning, I could not be more proud to collaborate with them on Change Agents Season 2. Ladies and gentlemen, Four Branches Bourbon is the only spirits company founded by veterans from the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force. These veterans collaborated with a Bourbon Hall of Fame master distiller and legend to help them make their smooth but complex blend of four grain and 96 proof bourbon blended and bottled in Bardstown, Kentucky. It is often said that bourbon without a story is just brown water. And this bourbon has a story with over a hundred combined years of military service around the world. At Four Branches, they are not just crafting some of the finest bourbon, but they are reshaping the drinking narrative. Their motto, drink honorably, embodies their ethos of sipping to remember, not to forget. And as veterans, we get to come home while others did not. So if you're going to drink, please drink honorably and don't drink to forget, but let's sip to remember. And if you are going to sip and you like bourbon, this has a very interesting taste. Not that I'm a bourbon connoisseur or expert, but smoother than I thought it would be. I've had some bourbons that about ripped my face off. This was the exact opposite. So please enjoy honorably. If you want to learn more about Four Branches, please check out their story at fourbranches.com and pick up a bottle of their fine bourbon today using the code IRONCLAD10. That is all one word, iron, normal spelling, C-L-A-D-10. And you're going to get 10% off. Young soldiers want to be tested, and I think that's been the the case since the inception of human beings fighting other human beings. There's this line in the sand. You know, you go, you go into a profession of arms, and oftentimes you're surrounded by the elder generation, and by that I mean people probably two years older than you, <laughs> who you look at and go, I'll never be that old. Uh, but especially in a wartime where there are those who have experienced combat and those who have not, the younger soldiers, and, and I put myself squarely in this camp as well, you you practice all these things, they're conceptual, and you have in the back of your mind this question, what's it going to be like for real? How am I going to mm -hmm. perform when it is for real? 
And I'm just curious how it was for you. You know, you, you came across that line from conceptual to practical. What were your thoughts um, before and after? I know one of the first things I experienced was I was I was a little disappointed that I wasn't part of the the dismount element. I was like, man, you know, but at the same time, I'm like, I played a good role. You know, I got my truck into the fight. I stayed in my lane, which is really what, you know, you have to be aware of everything else around you. But at the same time, you know, you don't want to Leroy Jenkins this sucker. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was a little disappointed that I wasn't on that end, but I was I was happy that it went the way that it was. And I really saw that there's a reason why they, they put out what they did and why they trained us so hard. You know, I mean, we were pushed – we were pushed really hard during our uh, ITC. So the intensive training cycle prior to the, the buildup for deployment, as well as the JRTC, um, which was down, you know, that's an exercise down in uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, to where you're supposed to be able to put this stuff into action, you know, somewhere else. Um, and to kind of see on how all that played in and how all of that train up and stuff worked towards what we did right then and then to blow through that and to be sitting around a campfire afterwards with the brits you know eating a burger laughing and joking about what had just happened um to where you know really on the on the objective and af afterwards as you're loading dead bodies of people up you know of people that were just shooting at you trying to kill you uh and realizing just the i guess the gravity of the situation what just happened you know man you know i could have died but i made it through and i'm moving forward they're not yeah um but it's due to that training and stuff that really worked out and you know later on in the argonab it was just a different story because really from there our training didn't prepare us for that end of things and that's really where that adaptive type thing and that resilience that was built in that's where that came into play so i mean it was just a different two different experiences but that one right there that one was where training really paid off. Well, it was more reflective of the training you had done leading up to it. You know, you mentioned in the uh, Argandab that things changed. There's probably quite a few people who will watch this or listen to this who are not familiar with the uh, Argandab River Valley. Can you just kind of describe the area, kind of the environment that that is before we dive into the things that happen there? Yeah, absolutely. So the Argandab, as opposed to Hellman, Hellman, you have very much what you think of or when you see like a desert type deployment to where it's sand, you know, Tatooine type <laughs> little mud buildings. It's a good description whatnot. actually. Like, yeah. But the Argon Dob, you have a little bit of a mixture of everything. I mean, it's, it's a Valley. You can, if you bring up a map of it, you can really see the surrounding area, but then that river and all of that lush green and that follows it. So I mean, you could, man, you could really just Google it and throw it up there and, and see. But you have mountainous terrain, you have the valleys underneath, and then you have a whole bunch of farmers and stuff and irrigated lands through there. So when springtime comes, it's a every season throughout there is a different fighting experience. So like when we came in, it was December. So it was muddy. It was cold. Uh, I think the, the top temperature was 80 degrees. You know, that was uh, that was winter out there was 80. But then you have that shift. Um, everything out there is dead. You have the the mountainside and then everywhere in between, you know, the, the pomegranate orchards and everywhere else, there's walled off. There's walls, you know, so a wall for this particular orchard and then a wall for this field and walls that are eight to 10 feet tall, uh, walling off these grape fields and stuff. And it was just compound after compound and having to move through that type of environment um it was rough what what would you estimate the average lateral distance that you could see you know you're describing all these uh segregated areas with walls and i'm sure there are times when of course you can see out through the the fields but when you're moving through those areas are we talking like sub 50 yards you're able to see oh man yeah the orchards absolutely yeah 50 meters at max yeah. um you know which is why a lot of times we would skirt around and use some of the farming farming fields so that you'd actually have some standoff and you'd be able to see maybe 150 meters to 200 at maximum but even then um that was it you know that was the maximum amount of distance it was a very close fight if you ever got into anything yeah that's not a lot of standoff i mean that obviously gives you the opportunity to use 
concealment and cover. The two should not be confused, even though they often are. Um, but it gives your enemy the opportunity to do so as well. I mean, that is that is a that is a close proximity fight that can go bad real fast. Yeah, and that, that's another reason why we had guys up on the mountainside with, you know, they're constantly scanning the valley with thermals. You know, that was one of the biggest things. Look for patterns of life and then look for things that don't fit those patterns of life. Because most times, you know, the, the farmers and stuff out there, they're in their routine. Yeah. You know, the locals within those villages, they're doing the same thing every day. You have to to survive. It's the other people that aren't supposed to be there that are a little off. Yeah. So you have the book right in front of you. And I don't know if people can see the image well. I have it in front of me, too, and you can see it better. Um, what really sticks out in that image is an American flag. And eh, maybe people can see it. Or you could Google damn the valley of the book and you can see the image right there tell me the story of that picture because i know it's not just a random snapshot that was taken no that uh that is taken on the battlefield to where that flag was um was actually in this cover picture that's shown they're pulling it out but the instance they're pulling it out of a group of rubble but the instance on what had happened was the enemy had driven a thousand pound vehicle id uh, so just a vehicle laden with explosives, about a thousand pounds of it, right up to as far as they could up to the gate of uh, where second platoon was staying, and they detonated it. So essentially flattening most of the compound that the guys were going to end up burying a lot of the guys alive. It killed a, a group of three Afghan children that were there, and you know after everybody was recovered and pulled out of there and medevac and things were calming down they're going through and they're recovering everything else within that particular compound they saw the flag you know kind of buried and it didn't sit right and it was um brian erickson i want to say it was uh eli rivera and uh, rodney garcia they all that's who's pictured as erickson and uh rivera pulling that pulling that flag out to fly it back above and kind of show them that, hey, we're not, we're, we're here to stay. You know, you're not moving us. You might knock us down, but we're here to stay. And that was something, too, that in the making of this that really became special is once uh, Erickson had found that I was using this as the cover photo. And really it was because that exemplified our feeling, you know, the feeling of the guys throughout this deployment is like, no matter what, we're, we're here to stay. You know, you're not, you're not going to, you can, you can beat us up, but you're not going to keep us down um he came forward and was like you know i have that flag i'm like are you kidding me like he's like no i recovered that flag i brought it home with us that means something to me and i was wondering if there's any way we could use it for this particular project and i'm like well let me see if maybe we can get it into the unit case maybe we can have you bring it down there and you know turn it over because that's just part of that unit history you know i think that's something that's important to preserve and through one thing or another, it just it didn't happen that way to where we couldn't get a hold of the right authorities within the unit to do that. And it ended up to where the Airborne Special Operations Museum in town, we had held a ceremony there after we came back. And there's a paver of all the guys that we lost, that the battalion lost, out in front of the Airborne Special Operations Museum. So I tried them next, and I called them, and crazy enough, just the curator picked up the phone. It wasn't even like the front desk people. I guess he was like passing by. Nobody else was there and he, he picked it up. And I go into my pitch, you know, one, as soon as I find out he's the curator um, and the phone just goes silent. You know, after like 30 seconds, I'm like, all right, is this guy still on or did he hang up on me? <laughs> and I'm like, um, you know, and he just, it, one thing led to, to another and he's just, you know, I've been waiting for this phone call. And it was just a fact of, he's like, there's nothing from Afghanistan. You know, the unit historians that they used to have, that they brought it around with them, and so that doesn't exist anymore. That program doesn't, doesn't exist. So, I mean, you have to extrapolate something like that, either from uh, the AARs that they have out there, which is the act, after action review paperwork they send up. Do they really have everything and what really happened in there? You know, you'd have to go through every leader's book. You'd have to talk to everyone to really get the stories down to this level on what really happened. So, you know, he saw the value in that. And again, 
you know, <laughs> one thing led to another. And there we were on the book launch day presenting the flag over to be put into the DOD historical archives, which now it's part of the collection down at the Airborne Museum and a bunch of other stuff from those stories. Pretty amazing. I, I can't think of a better home for it, actually. Fortuitous, too, that yeah. was on, on the book launch as well. You know, speaking of the book, how did the members of your unit feel when I'm assuming that you approached them uh, with the idea or the fact that you were writing the book? What were their thoughts on that? So there was another book that was written out there just prior to this one. Um, and that's kind of what spun this one up was there was a lot of the guys were, there was a lot of mumbles behind the scenes about, well, what's going on with this story. This is a journalist. He doesn't know our, our story. He wasn't there, you know, and I kind of was like, Hey guys, like this is a, this is another, this is one of, you know, not one of us. He wasn't like a paratrooper, but this is another veteran. This is a, a combat veteran Marine by the name of Ben Kessling that decided to write our story down. And I thought if anything, it was the best chance for those guys to have uh, their story being brought forward. This book is something I never wanted to write myself. Um, and you know, cause it, really what you're doing is you're challenging people's memories. You're challenging what they hold. And, and within this, some of that did come out to where some of those guys didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to revisit, um, uh, you know, one of them in particular, you know, he, he was like, man, I've been dreading this phone call. But then after about three hours of talking about it, he stopped the conversation and was just like, you know, it's like, I'm really glad that we're talking about this stuff right now it feels like i haven't talked about this stuff with anybody in so long that it just feels like a burden is being lifted off of me because i feel like i've carried this stuff with me and i just haven't been able to put into words or process it so i think that's one of the most important things on putting these stories down because even for myself in writing this my life has kind of gone at a pace to where it's been so quick that I haven't slowed down enough to process a lot of everything that happened in there. And I always thought that ah, I'm not really affected. You know, that didn't, that didn't touch me in any sort of way. I, I matter of fact, I even asked my, the uh, psychologist team and stuff that I have that what's going on here. You know, why do I feel like I can talk about this stuff, but other guys shut down about it. And the closest thing that we came to on that is the fact that I was a little older and you have mm -hmm. the prefrontal cortex being fully formed. I was, you know, this deployment, I was 28 during it. So you have uh 25, 26 is really when your prefrontal cortex is um, those neural pathways and everything are solid. So a lot of these guys, you have to think about a lot of them that experienced these traumas and stuff back then, they're 18 to 20, maybe 21. Yeah. So in that case, you, you're putting these people through these traumatic events. And if they never go back and face what happened and process, there's something about trauma that really they get stuck in this loop. They're stuck right back to where they were. Yeah. If you don't deal with your shit over a long enough timeline, this shit's going to come back and deal with you. This week on Borderland, an Ironclad original, host Vincent Vargas talks to cartel and border expert Jason Jones. What you're seeing is a forward operating base run by Mayo Zambada's faction of the Sinaloa cartel just across from Aravaca, Arizona. It's on the Mexico side, but it's 100 yards from your border. And you see he's got two AK-47s, but that's not really the important part of this. It's the trade crap. Look at the handheld radio, the lifeblood of the organization. This is how they know when to move products, and then they'll move deadly drugs into the country or they'll move bodies. If Americans watching right now are wondering where this ends, let me tell you where it ends. All you have to do is look to Mexico to see what is coming here. Watch Borderland everywhere you get your podcasts and on YouTube at This Is Ironclad. There's a lot of things I like about the Mountain Tough program, but I think primarily what I enjoy is they focus on mental toughness in addition to just the physical toughness. Everything they do is grounded in one purpose, life transformations and being strong between the years in the mind. And there's also a community of 15,000 plus Mountain Tough athletes. So the community is strong, they're supportive, and they're gonna help keep you accountable. So you can train anywhere, 
You can stream anywhere. You can access guided training and on-demand workouts right from your phone, your tablet, or TV or computer, whatever you're into. And everything you need is in one spot. The Mountain Tough subscription gets you access to all the Mountain Tough programs, new programs, and bonus content. And they have programs for everyone. Those who hit the gym and heavy weights, those who like to work out at home with no gear or minimal gear, and everything in between. Mountain Tough has been the trusted training by the dedicated for years now including U.S. military, special forces, and dedicated backcountry hunters. There is no excuse for you to not start the day. With Mountain Tough, you can conquer your goals with the ideal program for your lifestyle and schedule. Train with equipment or just your body weight on your phone, tablet, TV, or web browser. Most importantly, they will help you train your mindset so you are always ready for anything that life throws away. Mountain Tough subscribers get full access to world-class home and gym programs, groundbreaking mental toughness training, self-improvement, prehab and rehab, biomechanical form coaching, stretching and mobility flows, nutrition guidance, challenge workouts, and the global Mountain Tough community. Mountain Tough is offering Change Agents listeners an incredible offer. You're going to get 40% off on the all-new Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription with the code CHANGEAGENTS. Go to mtntough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to receive 40% off, a savings of about $100 on your Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription. That is mtn, Mike Tango November, tough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to save 40%. That is less than 50 cents per day for the best in-class physical and mental training. One of the things that I really appreciate about your book, or I should say I enjoyed about your book, actually both, is that you wrote it through the lens of just not your own experience, that you, you know, specifically that first, uh, I, the first one you cover the IED experience where the horrendous situation where somebody's climbing over a wall and there's an IED embedded in the wall and you were able to tell the story from different people that were there. And I think that's important for a couple of reasons, but mainly human beings' memory is not perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And you'd have a dozen people there and you'd have a dozen different retellings of that tale. And they're all true to the degree that the person, that's what they are remembering and that's what they see. So I appreciated that you kind of looked at it from a 360 degree approach, but I'm curious, you know, you mentioned one of the conversations that started with, hey, I, I was dreading this phone call. And the conversations you did have with people, because this book came out, you know, 10 years after the fact, how fresh were those memories in their mind? I'm curious about the degree with which they are still living with these things 10 years in the rearview mirror. So my position in what I was doing, being the RTO, so being the radio telephone operator, I'm out on almost every mission because you have to have comms on the battlefield, especially a modern battlefield. Yeah. So when you take in these other perspectives, you have to think too is – it wasn't always a particular squad, you know, that was in there. So I, it was really, that had to be part of it. You had to put these other perspectives into it because my job at the same time, you know, I'm the combo guy. I might not be seeing it from, you know, matter of fact, I know for a fact, I, I, the situation you were talking about, one of the guys in particular was blown over the wall with the other guy that became our, you know, our first KIA out there. Nobody saw what he saw for the first five minutes, you know, and as well as these different pictures and stuff, these different snapshots within there that once you start putting everything together, there's another instance that I'm thinking of to where someone was hit with an IED and the sequence of events happened but there was people that I had talked to that they actually took themselves and they put themselves in the body of the person doing that particular action. And it was very clear, you know, and then even going, so the one I'm thinking of is um, Sergeant Lee. He gets, uh, they came out, we were out on a patrol and uh, private bets sets off the, uh, you know, a few days of hell basically to where, that's where uh, we lost quite a few guys. It started off with Betts, and then it was Lee. Edinger lost a leg. That's when uh, Staff Sergeant Brunkhorst was blown up. But Lee was down in this canal when this thing went off. And 
one of the other, you know, one of the people that was in charge at the time had thought that he was the one that pulled this particular person out of, out of the canal, you know, and it was, I'm like, huh, that's strange. And I started talking to a few of the other guys and, and everything didn't match up to what his story, like everything matched up, but not that he was doing those actions. Yeah. And it took me having to talk to, uh, you know, Lee in particular at the very end. All right. Who actually pulled you out of here? And then getting that picture of it afterwards. But then, all right, how do I explain this? How do I bring this back, this information back to this guy? Cause this is going to be published and be like, Hey, look, I don't want you to freak out, but you might want to think about what happened here because this is what I found out about it. And I don't want him to read it and go, what? Like, that's not what happened. I want him to be able to kind of process that uh, beforehand. And it, it was really finding out that in these situations of trauma, people will do that. People will actually put themselves, humans sync up, and especially ones that have been trained and, and operating at these different levels or in these high-stress environments and stuff to where survival is <laughs> your end, end state goal, I guess, would be. And uh, that's actually what ended up happening was, you know, I mean, he kind of viewed that he did this particular action when it wasn't him at all. So coming across these different instances and challenging, I guess, not not me challenging it, but it's challenging what their beliefs have been up to that whole time. You know, it, that's sort of a tricky situation to deal with. Yeah, the fog of war is real for sure. Um, you know, it's interesting. We're talking about the sh uh, soldier's perspective, but you wrote a book about this. And a lot of families are going to read these books. And I suspect yes. that it might be some of the first time that they are hearing about what their family members went through. And I'm curious what the response has been from some of the families. So I, I actually, I've had a few reach out, you know, and in particular, um, there, there are guys out there, you know, like with this other book. They started reading it and they, they told their family, like, do not read that other book. Like, this didn't don't even read it, you know, and it took them up until some of the other guys reaching out and saying, Hey, have you read Yeski's book yet? And them going, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not touching it. I don't want to go down that pathway. Hey, you should check it out, you know, and hearing them come back and say, you know, I, I know that was a rough read and that really brought me back there but I've told my parents that that's okay, you know, and then to hear from that end, the families of that end or the, the wives from that end and say, thank you for putting this down. Um, they never talked about this. I knew it was bad or I knew some of the stories, but I never knew it was at that level. Um, I understand a little bit more now, you know, and even some of them, some of those families and stuff, they, at this point, you know, it's a broken family, you know, and they yeah. can point back to you and go that right there, that deployment is exactly, you know, what happened. That's why we are in the situation we're in now. Yeah. So I, it's tough. It's tough to hear some of that. I don't know if it's possible to, uh, to quantify the power or value of people being able to express their experiences, which kind of brings me back to, I told you, we'd talk a little bit about Sebastian Younger He's been on the show. I know that you recently linked up with him. I'm so happy that you were able to do so. He's he's pretty for a dude who never carried a rifle for a living. That <laughs> goddamn that man has found himself and found his way into some pretty gnarly situations. And for those of you unfamiliar, okay. I mean, yeah, I would point you just towards start with Restrepo. Uh, a documentary that does a damn good job of capturing what it was like. Um, you know, you, were you talking about in the Argandab, a little bit more down south? He was farther up north, yep. and uh, different terrain. But I mean, he was intermingled, enmeshed with that element was there. Um, but he has a he has started an organization based around the Vets Town Hall principle, where. Find a location. I believe his is specifically on, uh, is it Veterans Day or Memorial Day? It's one of the two. And I think it's Memorial Day. I think it's Memorial Day too. But of course, both of us saying that we're probably wrong and it's probably Veterans Day. But <laughs> point being, it's it's a holiday, so nobody's going to be using the town hall. 
So allow veterans, bring people in and allow veterans the opportunity to come up and talk about their experience. And I believe he limits it to uh, to 10 minutes, but you can talk about, I mean, people who served in a non wartime environment all the way back to how, you know, World War II, if they're able to do so, the Vietnam and Korea and Cold War and all of these things. And you listen to him talk about the power of it. And I'm just curious your thoughts and maybe what you have seen just in the soldiers that you shared space and time with over in Afghanistan. What would you say, how would you describe the power of people being able to have a voice to their experience? I mean, that's, that's, really the whole thing on what a lot of this has been about you know that's why the wall of stories and stuff is up on there is it is therapeutic for these guys to go back you know and to revisit that end of it you know we were just talking before about that with processing the trauma processing what happened you know and breaking it down um but also having that outlet you know letting it out but in a in a whether it's that opening to it to where it's just a 10 minute free forum, you know, giving this guy the space to open up about it to where, Hey, we will listen, you know, uh, that is, there's, there's, there's a power to that. There's a power to being able to do that. And there's also, I mean, there's so many other organizations too, that are doing stuff as well. I mean, the veterans town hall is, is one thing that, you know, in talking to him, I want to get it down in Maryland as well. Cause a lot of it seems to be up in the Northeast, but people sharing these stories and sitting around a fire, you know, it's something that really I think as humans and as humankind, it's something that goes back to, you know, the days of early community, primal community end of things. Uh, you look at stuff in the Native American traditions to where the warriors would come back and they'd sit around the fire and talk about, you know, either the fallen or the events that had happened on the battlefield. And that's actually something that Sebastian Younger talks about in his book, um, Tribe. Yeah. You know, that's the one I was pointing to on the on the yeah. bookshelf right there. It's a fantastic book. But I absolutely. Yeah. I I feel that that's something that the community, you know, and the veteran community in particular needs to be doing. You know, we need to have uh you had said something on the other podcast that I was on with you on Cleared Hot about the veteran suicide problem. Yeah. And is there is there really a solution to it? And you know, I thought about that. that. Actually, I didn't really answer you then. And I kind of thought about that. And I thought about that a lot on the way back. And something that somebody said sort of brought it right back to me is that, you know, the solution within the veteran community, especially around suicide, is there actually a solution to a full on solution to somebody committing suicide? I think it's my personal belief that once somebody's decided, you know, I mean, that's a when anybody's decided something that's they're usually going to follow through i tend to agree yeah but where they get to that point you know you look at modern day society to where there's no there's not really a tribe around us anymore that community the sense of community and stuff uh whether it's the veteran community or just community in general there's an issue there these days there's a huge issue there people don't talk to other people i guess do, do you really know your neighbors anymore that's one of the biggest things that's the first thing i i do if i move is i go around and i personally go door to door and meet my neighbors because i want to know who's around me i want to see the faces i want to be able to talk to them and you know if you've been out there and seen uh, a thing or two you can kind of get that vibe from somebody all right who am i who am i dealing with um but to get that face to face and get that community around it uh Anything community and anything where you're bringing people in like that is a good thing. It's interesting. Really, I think there just needs to be more yeah. across the board. It's interesting you bring up the native communities. You know, they were very intentional about how they would transition the war fighters back into the community. It wasn't, hey, they're back and just cruise back into your teepee and, you know, life's going to be fine. I mean, I think that that approach, and I've heard of many uh, previous cultures man, all the way back, kind of almost all the way to the Spartans, where it's this intentional approach. Acknowledge the trauma. And here's the thing about trauma. It's not an even scale of justice, not that the scales of justice are equal either. I mean, if you have six people experience <laughs> something, it's fascinating to me. It you know Some people are extremely yeah. bothered by it, and other people, it's like water bouncing off a Teflon frying pan. It just doesn't bother them. And then sometimes you could flip it, and the absolute inverse would happen. But 
treating it as what it is, a traumatic experience, a traumatic occupation, and acknowledging that and not just allowing people to go isolate in the wild, for lack of a better term. Yes. I think we would be better we would be better served for that. I don't know the mechanism for which to do that and I, we talked about this a little bit when you were on Cleared Hot. I don't know if the United States government is necessarily the entity to do that. I think that might be the role of the NGO or non-government organization that sits in between the VA or the organizations that pick up veterans post service, but I do think I do think it would help to be a little bit more intentional with those people because the more I have had conversations with people from these backgrounds it just rings true every time. Like if you don't deal with your trauma at some point yep. in time, when you least want it to, your trauma is going to come deal with you and it's not going to be pretty. Yeah. Yeah. For you, what was the most challenging thing that you had to deal with on that deployment? Mm, on that deployment, man, I was, honestly, a lot of that was a blur. Uh, it was, up until the point, you know, you were just doing one thing after another, after another, I would say is probably the most challenging was when I started to get in my own head about, you know, who's going to be next. I, I found myself, we were leaving, you know, leaving the ECP, leaving out to go on a patrol ECP, the entry control point. And we're leaving out to go onto a combat patrol. And I just was thinking to myself, all right, who's it going to be this time? Who's, who's next? Who's going to step on one next? And I said to myself, you know, that was, you cross that threshold to where, hey, man, you, you got to stop thinking like that. You have one job to do, and it's to be the best freaking guy on the radio that they've ever possibly seen, you know, and to maintain the best communications and awareness around you, you know, to keep these guys alive. You're already dead. Get over it. When it comes, it comes. And coming to that realization um, that changed a lot, you know, and from there, it, it, everything else didn't matter, you know, and you can kind of, that's sort of been a, I guess, either a litmus test, you know, going forward and saying, Hey, where, where's your head at with this? You know, what are you doing? Are you, are you limiting yourself? Um, or are you going to kind of take that, that whole same thing? Like you're already gone. Like, what are you going to leave behind you? What are your thoughts on that headspace now? 10 years removed. If you could go back and talk to that uh, young man getting ready to leave the ECP, what would you tell him? Keep trucking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Easier. Seriously, not, yeah. that's like, honestly, that's, uh, I wouldn't change a damn thing. Um, you know, really with, there's been portions of my life to run where I've been like, man, was I really in the right place in the right time and stuff? But that particular time in the Valley, uh, I can, I can tell you for sure that I was meant to be there. Yeah. You know, well, the headspace makes sense because I'm going to read something from here that is just mind blowing. But in, at the book, you explained at one point the prosthetics ward at Walter Reed was filled with soldiers from your deployment. Um, you know many of these soldiers personally. How has how has it been their life moving forward from that? I mean, kind of just explain, if you will, like what I just said is easy to read off in a few sentences, but explain. <laughs> From firsthand experience, what I'm actually talking about, and then how I'm assuming you're in touch with some of these people. Even how how has their life progressed? Or, and I mean, a more honest question would be for some of them: Have they been able to progress in their life? I know, and that that actually is that continual revisiting to that because I see some of them, and they're doing great things, or they have done great things. It almost seems like a bunch of them took that adversity in their lives, and they really went forward. There was uh, one of them, uh, Nick. Nicholas Edinger, where he was a strong man before, you know, and he ends up losing a leg and he got down on himself until he realized like, Hey, you know what? I can still do this stuff. Fuck what society says I can't do, you know, fuck what the doctors say I can't do. And he went forward with uh, Derek Carver there and they competed in the world's strongest man competition. You know I mean? It's um, well, world's strongest disabled man competition, but I mean, they're doing the exact same stuff that they yeah. do. <laughs> it's actually bullshit because he actually, instantly increased his strength to weight ratio. I mean, I'm not advising that anybody do that, take that path, <laughs> but I think that might be considered performance enhancing. I don't know. We're going to have to go to the judges on that. <laughs> I don't think anybody that uh, was involved in, a, in an IED incident is going to say that's performance enhancement for sure. 
<laughs> they went from the world we came from. The just, I mean, I can't. I have a hard time explaining the the gallows humor that used to get me through right. the day. <laughs> that was one of the things. I mean, that's uh, second platoon. They would joke around about it, but as they were leaving for patrol, you know, some of the guys would be like, "I've got no legs. I've got no legs," and I'm just like, "Oh my god, man!" Just to have that dark, uh, dark humor about it. Yeah, but legitimately, at Walter Reed, the prosthetics wing was full of people from your unit at one point. Yeah, they just kept bringing them in, bringing them in, just trucking in, hey, fresh meat, you know, and it was just, that. it's crazy to me just that that entire word there was full of guys from our our unit, just one after another, you know, and as they're coming in, hey, welcome to the crew, (laughs) Yeah, you know. So two more questions for you, and then I'll let you go to be respectful of our time. We talked about the power for the person reliving their experiences and how that can be cathartic. Why do you think it's important to go to the other side, the people receiving that information? Why do you think it's important that we as a society be there to listen? I mean, look at the day and age we're in right now. You know, you have things popping off uh, in Europe. You have Israel. You have the stuff on the border, uh, the war with the cartels. I mean... Through conflict and through this, these other instances, evil is going to exist in the world, you know. And there are people that raise their hand and say, "Send me," and they go. But to listen to these stories and listen to these lessons, it's important to put this stuff down. You know, it's important to listen to them because if you don't learn from history, the history is doomed to repeat itself. You know, there are lessons ingrained within these stories. There's lessons ingrained within what everybody's talking about. I guess it's just to find and extrapolate from what portions and stuff, what's going to be useful in your own. And you really know, you you don't know how something is going to come across to a certain person, you know, or how they're going to hear it. So it might not be something for you, um, but to be damn sure, you know, somebody else out there is gleaning something from it. Yeah. I land in kind of the same place where, you know, if you don't study your history, you're doomed to repeat it. But in our modern society, where 0.05% of the population is willing to raise their hand. And for the last 10 years, everybody except for the Marine Corps has fallen short of their recruiting goals. It's it's almost invisible to a degree. You know, it's out there, but it's kind of invisible. And most people might know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, almost like a six degrees of, you know, Kevin Bacon away from military service. But I would hope, my hope is that If people are forced to hear these stories, hopefully it works its way towards the policymakers who, with the stroke of a pen, can allocate human capital towards an engagement or an area or an ideal that uh, is going to have huge impact, but they're not going to actually do it themselves. That's my overall goal. Or that's what I would like to have see come from those things. All right. Last question. Where can people find more? about you and your book how can they best support what you have going on so kind of the link tree on there is damnthevalleybook.com you also have a lot of the social media campaign stuff uh just at damn the valley book on instagram facebook uh man tiktok youtube you go across the board we even have a reddit now um which that, that sounds enough. more dangerous than the Argandab River Valley to be honest. <laughs> right. In, in some instances. <laughs> in some instances. The reach is crazy though. Yeah. Um I literally had people I posted a, a village picture up on on there of one of the villages that we operated in. And crazy enough I had someone contact me. So out of nowhere and he was like my family evacuated that's my home village. My family evacuated there back in 2012 uh which you can look up exactly what happened in 2012 um but i remember you guys on your patrols and i asked him some specific stuff and he knew like it it was legitimate so i mean the the reach in these things is unbelievable so beyond i know it's beyond anything what i would have ever thought you know and to be able to Put things up on social media about, um, you know, I've had to build bots in because Afghans and stuff have been reaching out and saying, hey, I'm in this area. I'm in Pakistan about to be deported back. Yeah. Do you know any organizations that work with this and help on there? So, I mean, it's really crazy on how 
technology and ability and, and modern day society, what you can do if you just have a listening ear to it. But yes, damn the valley book. <laughs> dot com. I'll go into a complete segment on that end. Um, at Damn the Valley Book, you can get the book on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. But really, um, what it is is, you know, I want everybody to be able to hear these stories, uh, but also just to be able to listen, listen to the other people in their life that they know, and know that like this, it's okay. You know, what you're going through is not, it's not a just you thing. There's others out there and there's others that are willing to help. There's others that are willing to step up. And there's other guys that are, uh, matter of fact, Charlie Company, the company across the river that I talk about in there, they, we would hear hellacious firefights every other day. And to where we lost um, specialist Chris Moon over there, he was one of the snipers that was assigned to us in Helmand. Uh, his story's in there, you know, and the guys from Charlie, I got them a, a, a deal with Casemate as well. Whether they're going to take it or not, I don't know yet, but he's even been reached out to by guys from the 101st that replaced us afterwards. So, I mean, this is stuff that is just helping each other out, furthering the community and, and really pushing these stories out um, because it's a good thing for other guys. If you want to learn more about the stories of 1st Platoon, Bravo Company, 2nd of the 508th, 82nd Airborne, yes, that is a mouthful, you can go to damnthevalleybook.com. That's normal spelling on all of that. Damnthevalleybook.com. Thank you again for tuning in to Change Agents and Ironclad Original, presented by Montana Knife Company. We're going to be back in a week with an all-new guest. I'll see you guys then. Today's episode of Change Agents is brought to you by the Navy SEAL Foundation. And they are special to me for obvious reasons. I have a genetic tie to them through my time in service, and I've actually worked with them on a variety of fundraising and charitable initiatives. Their entire mission is to provide critical support for warriors, veterans, and families of Naval Special Warfare. Fundraising is really hard. It's hard to ask people for money, especially if you are asking them for a check with nothing in return. Um, I wish I could say it would be as easy as pulling on somebody's heartstrings and they reach into their wallet and they give what they can. But oftentimes, people are hesitant to give unless they can see the tangible results of the money or they get something in return. So I'm about to offer you that opportunity. The Navy SEAL Foundation has just launched their winter apparel line and they have everything that you need to stay warm because we're in the winter. So what better than supporting charity, but also getting something to keep you warm in return. So you can step up your style while you're showing your support. Each purchase directly contributes to honoring Naval Special Warfare and their families. You can visit shop.navysealfoundation.org to grab your gear now.